um, form or shape. Composition. Well, it's very fresh. Very evocative. It's extremely refreshing. Colour. It's extremely optimistic. Their memorable touch. It is all about the paint. They're timeless. Two thousand and thirteen marks the centenary of the birth of William Scott, a painter who would revolutionise British art forever. Renowned for his form, abstraction and exploration of colour, Scott spent most of his professional life painting in the southwest of England, making Bath and the surrounding areas his home. Scott's work explores the genres of still life, landscape and the nude. Abstraction of everyday objects would feature often in his work. Pots and pans would be used for their shape and form and would be placed with food on a simple kitchen table. In the 1950s, Scott was one of the leading forces in linking up with artists in the States, most notably Mark Rothko. In April 2012, John Bennington, manager of the Victoria Art Gallery in Bath, secured the painting Bottle and Fish Slice by William Scott for the gallery's collection. Painted in his studio in Hallatro in 1949, it marks the beginning of Scott's time at the Bath Academy of Art. I was in a, uh, a gallery in London, a commercial gallery, and as I was about to leave, this little picture had just come in. I thought, for somebody who'd spent 46 years of their life actually on the doorstep of this gallery, more or less, his local footprint seemed to be virtually invisible. I think it's very important that Bath have a, a painting of his. Uh, it's, it's particularly important because he was working near Bath. He taught at the Bath Academy of Art, so he was very connected. Unbeknown to us, a group of art students from Chew Valley, we had an influential artist on our doorstep for over 30 years. We wanted to learn more about the artist, teacher and man that was William Scott. The Bath Academy of Art, uh, as it was established here at Caution Court, was uh, a very radical institution, one of uh, only a few in the country that were founded in that way. But there were a whole collection of very significant artists brought together, and those included Scott. So there was this old 17th century building you know, full of Van Dykes and all things, and here was going to be the most modern art school in the country. Now, it sounds like, you know, complete opposites, but actually it worked superbly well. Oh, it was wonderful, absolutely wonderful. You had these great big rooms full of light to paint in and beautiful views from the windows of the gardens and the shriek of peacocks every minute or two. It was just lovely. I think it was in my second year that I asked specifically if I could go to his class. It was really because I was seeking for some kind of simplicity in painting, which I couldn't get. I couldn't sort of arrive at somehow by my own investigations. So uh, William Scott was, a, was a, a really good move for me. Scott's work was very influential amongst his pupils. Uh, for example, Sir Howard Hodgkin uh, came here to Corsham as a, as a student, first of all. Scott spent ten years as senior painting master at Bath Academy of Art at Corsham Court. The school was a unique residential art school for teachers and students. The Academy bred a wealth of well-known artists during his time there. Howard Hodgkin, Clifford Ellis, Terry Frost and Brian Winter were all contemporaries of Scott. It's not the way he would like to have seen it, but people think of him as the frying pan man. The frying pan was merely an object that he had, had adopted. It was an object that he could remember, but he was, 
he was abstracting it so that it was becoming more and more shapes or objects on a canvas. There is a strong element of the belief in traditional values of work. Scott's belief and interest in space and the organisation of space is something which is then reflected in his study of work such as the English artist Stubbs, the painter of, of horses. People react in all sorts of different ways and I, and I think that's, that contrast is, is, is healthy. Um, you know, that people do have those different reactions and even if people say, oh, I really hate it, you know, at least they're making a reaction. But it does, I think, it does go back to his Presbyterian working class roots in Northern Ireland, that there were these simple things in the home um, that you see in his paintings. And his connection, I think, for us students, you know, the opening up was his huge connection with French painting. And then, of course, as soon as 1949, 51, 52, 53, when I was there as a student, that's when the, the American painters started to become really important in this country. So he goes from those very humble beginnings to, to become somebody who entertains Mark Rothko and his wife in 1959 at Halitro, at a time when both artists were working on huge mural paintings, Scott for Alt Galvin in Northern Ireland and Rothko for the Seagram building in New York. So Rothko came and stayed and um, again I didn't really know that he was famous, I just thought he was this American painter. Scott first made connections with the American scene in the 1950s through his relationships with artists, gallery owners and museums. Scott's later work formed a bridge between the American and European traditions like no other figure in Britain during that time. I remember he was a very funny man. He was actually, could be very witty. He was very hard working and he, he would work every day. He was allowed to come out of the studio at 11 o'clock for 11s. He'd have a cup of coffee. And on one occasion, he came out and uh, it was 5 to 11. My mother said, William, it's not 11 o'clock yet. Back you go. And um, he had to go back to the studio and do a little bit more work and then come out. So it was very disciplined. He would sometimes come on holiday with us to Cornwall where again he would paint or he would make sculpture on the beach. He'd get a brick and he'd carve it and um, so he was always had his mind on, on his art. I think it was one person who said that they saw him one day out at his farm uh, watching the guy painting, painting the, the farm gate, you know, white. And he was actually intrigued by just the way this guy painted the paint on the thing. So it was anyone in the act of painting. That's what I learned from him more than anything else, was actually the business of painting, of the enjoyment of the stuff. It is clear that the legacy of William Scott still endures and inspires us all as artists today. Today, we're still seeing pears being painted and pots and sometimes people come and say, oh, is this a William Scott? And no, it's not. It's, uh, it's, it could be by a student or, or by someone who's been influenced. The legacy for um, students who are studying fine art and design is considerable. One, it represents uh, the way in which a group of artists who came together uh, increased the significance of their work individually through the collective spirit of sharing. And secondly, about the way in which they were able to extend um, their influence through a whole cohort of specialist teachers in the arts. I'm thankful that I studied with someone who wasn't interested in narrative, but was interested in shape making, application of paint, richness of colour, and uh, secured by this sense of tonality. I can't say it really clearer than that. Just constantly amazes me really how he, um, how he can pull off um, what looks like a very simple thing and make it look quite wonderful. Well, it's alive today. 
It may have gone down, uh, you know, with the abstract impressionism, but I think it's quite strong influence. And I think that has influenced English art. With an international career spanning five decades, Scott produced an extraordinary body of work and upholds a reputation as one of the leading British painters of the 20th century. With much of his life seeing him settled in the southwest, it's perfect that we are now able to appreciate Scott's work and understand the painting which sits among the collection at the Victoria Art Gallery today.